Okay, maybe we'll get started in this session. The uh, first talk is, is going to be on creating a zero harm culture through exceptional contractor management. This is going to be presented by Mick Rutledge. He's the general manager of Kennecott Utah Copper Smelter. So Mick started his career with Rio Tinto 24 years ago in England with Alcan in their power and smelting division. He has held many roles in the areas of maintenance, engineering, operations management, sorry, environment, health and safety, and business improvement. And finally, as a general manager for the Highland Power Stations and the aluminum smelter in Scotland before transferring to Rio Tinto Copper Group in the United States. So, Mick? We're, all, we're, 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 we're going to present together, so I don't know if you want to introduce uh, okay, so also Leo Okay, so I'll also introduce Leo. Yep. Yeah, we're going to be back Leo Jolly. So, Leo's primary area of focus are major project facilitation, organizational cultural change, business process improvement, as well as operations excellence, interventions across all of the Kepper, you better, triage, triage <laughs> in, uh, industry market. He has, worked, he has worked with all levels of organizations from the shop floor to the boardroom in client organizations such as JR Simplot, Kennecott Utah Copper, Mars, and Ridley's. Great, thanks. Shall we? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, good, good morning. Um, as you know, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, driving zero harm culture in the environment, and Mick and I are going to talk a little bit about how we approach that at KUC to help them look at how they manage their contractor base to get to this lofty goal. Let's see if this will move. So we'll, we'll give you a little bit of overview of both of our businesses, a little bit of KT's approach to improving business processes, the case around what we saw at KUC and how we work together some of the objectives around that, what the journey looked like, the results that came about, and some of the critical success factors to make this successful. But before we start, a little safety share? Yeah, yours. that would be good. So this is supposed to be an interactive session. Uh, so you're welcome to ask questions at any time. If you want, just bang your hand up and we'll stop what we're talking about and we'll, uh, we'll go off on whatever path you want to. Um, I apologize in advance for my accent. Probably some of you will struggle with that a little bit. And if I get a bit excited and start talking really quickly, uh, there's an interpreter down the front there, and uh, David George Kennedy will be able to help you uh, understand what I just said. But uh, if, you, if you miss a point, uh, I'm happy to be stopped. Uh, so what, is this, what does this say to you about uh, the subject that we're just about to talk about? Anybody? All quiet on the Western Front. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of messages in there. There's a lot of messages in there, but it leads into, into the work that we're, we're going to talk about today uh, because uh, it has to start at the top. Uh, senior leadership has to believe in what we want to achieve, and, and really the, the basis of that is a zero-harm culture in our business. And, uh, and hopefully we'll talk a little bit and you'll, you'll see a little bit around how we use that to introduce a disciplined, rigorous approach through uh, training, coaching, learning, and then application and handoff. Uh, so if you like, it starts off, uh, that's Kennecott Utah Copper Smelt as general manager there at the back, that's me. And, uh, and I'm following uh, Leo and his team uh, for a while. There we go. Uh, but uh, it does turn around uh, in the end, and, and so the strategy is to train, and coach, and then hand off so that we own that process. Um, and so that's why I put that up there. But uh, one of the other key points in that safety share is that you have to be willing to take a cold, hard look at what you do today. If you're not willing to do that and, uh, and, and draw out the warts and all, then uh, it's going to be really difficult for you to appreciate the opportunity to improve. So that's what we did, and it was, uh, we'll get to it a bit later, but it was a fairly uncomfortable experience on some fronts and good on others. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll push on. Sounds good. So we'll start with a little bit about Kepner Trigo, who we are, KT, and around our operational excellence focus. We do a lot of stuff around leadership with corporate strategy and goal setting, operation strategy. And from our point of view, there are some key things that we look at, what we call the drivers of operational excellence and advantage. It's around your human capabilities, your equipment, safety, quality compliance, and operations. 
what we have done as an organization is taken our core processes around human capability that Kepner Trigo is known for, our decision making processes, our project management, root cause analysis, find true cause processes, and our potential problem analysis, and embedded those into other kinds of areas to help you with how you get better at managing your equipment, safety, quality and compliance, and your business operations. So KT tries to take their processes and help you to incorporate them into the way you do business so they become seamless and useful for you and they become part of who you are at your DNA level. So a little bit from there, Nick, you can, yeah. So we'll cover a little bit uh, about Kennecott Utah Copper uh, very briefly. Uh, obviously a part of Rio Tinto, a global mining company. KUC, Utah-based, uh, mining the metals right through, so uh, a large mine, a big hole in the ground, a concentrator, a uh, smelter, a refinery, power, tailings and water services, uh, all as an integrated business. So actually six business units, all rolled into one business. So a pretty challenging environment to make changes. Um, about 2,000 plus internal employees, and then currently about five, 600 permanent contractors, and then a lot of transient contractors. And we'll come to some of the challenges that they present uh, later, but we're currently onboarding about 1,000 new contractors for, for an expansion that we're doing. But um, uh, at the smelter particularly, we also have a, a pretty special uh, transient challenge. Last year, we had a shutdown, and uh, within one month of May, we had to onboard 1,800 contractors, uh, get them to work safe, uh, do the job, meet the spec, and then get them off-site. And, uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges and some of the things we tried to do around cultural change and then where we ended up with controls on contractors around that. So the challenge, uh, to improve the safe, efficient, and effective management of contractors, a uh, big challenge for us, particularly with the onboarding, but also with all the embedded contractors that we have, to try and make sure that it was viewed that those contractors who are permanently on our sites uh, are viewed exactly the same as the internal employees, they work the same way to the same standards, and there's effectively no difference. Uh, unfortunately, there are some differences, so we needed this process to try and help we, help we deal with that. Uh, the biggest challenges, of course, uh, contractor costs escalating. You saw a graph in the last presentation uh, and one this morning uh, of that interesting curve leading up to 2008. And then everyone has this perception that those costs crashed back down into the basement after the global financial crisis where actually they didn't. They bumped down a little bit and then they came straight back up and, uh, and they're continuing to rise. And because of the scarcity of contractors, we're finding that um, uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to get the A-team contractors at the right cost, and then we're still having contractor injuries, and that's not acceptable. So the main uh, root of this presentation is about uh, the discipline and rigorous approach that we needed to ensure that we wouldn't hurt any of our contractors. Everybody comes to the site, uh, does a good job, and goes home safe. Uh, and then the benefits that came from that. I'll cover the way forward a little bit later. So with, with that as their challenge, from uh, our perspective as we worked with them and the leadership team, it became clear that the key place and tool that was gonna help them was really looking at their operational process. So how do we improve the business processes to the way you manage and control contractor activities? The way they scope that work, the way they communicate that work, schedule that work, and then manage that work as it's going on on site within the operations. So we employed our business process improvement methodology to go after that. So let's take, from our view, let's take a quick look at what we mean by business process. There's different levels of maturity. And when we're looking at business processes, first thing is gonna be key around its design. Business processes really wanna be customer focused, that they don't have a lot of non-value added steps within it, lot, no redundancies, no bottlenecks, and they parallel each other wherever possible. Along with that, you gotta understand, you may have a great process design, but if it isn't clear who does what within the process, and that we put the right skills in place to 
execute against that process and have the right information systems with capable users to use that, it's hard to keep that process going. So it's another level of process maturity that we want to look at in ensuring your processes are going to be able to work and get you the results. Lastly, where a lot of organizations that we saw, and, and Nick will talk a little bit about this later, the ability to manage that after it's in place. So knowing what all the metrics are that tell you your process is in control, that you've got the right monitoring and reporting systems to help it, that you have process ownership. Somebody who is always overlooking that process at an operational level and at a strategic level. That is it meeting our need and are we staffing it, fulfilling it, using it, and executing against it effectively? And having continuous improvement focus on it at all times. So we walked into this together to look at this with this as an understanding of this was what we were going to try to build in improving their contractor management activities. So the journey we take, you know, most organizations, you know, most consulting firms have a model with which we follow. We have one. It's an eight-step process. It really looks at each area of how you get to that maturity level. The first piece is really understanding what process are we going to go after and structuring it so we know wh where are we going to go dig and look at the right diagnostic tools that are get us to the right areas of focus to help you improve that. And Mick, you know, you can talk a little bit about how we worked with you at that point. Yeah, um, it, was, it was difficult because uh, it's like uh, herding cats. There's a lot of challenges uh, that you want to have a look at and you can't boil the ocean and do everything. So uh, we were already working a little bit with uh, KT on some other things. We liked some of the tools and, and certainly contractor management and what was coming over the horizon it was going to be a huge challenge. So we made a decision to try and focus in on that specifically on a few key tools, which uh, Leo will talk about. Uh, later, and then uh, really try and uh, get some of the noise out of the system and, and just focus in on a few specific things that we knew we needed to fix or that were already good, we needed them to be great. So from that, we, so they have this large contractor management system. We dialed in on the area of that where they felt like they had the most pain. So the next step of the process is now to really dig deep into that. And this is what we do, what we call our current state or as-is process. What we come, do is come in and work with the organization, with a key set of diagnostic tools that digs deep into every aspect of how you were planning, scoping, managing that kind of work. So you can really understand where you have pockets of excellence, where you have areas of opportunity, and where there are things that just don't exist. So you know that this was, I think, another challenging experience yeah, that, for that you. was the, probably the most interesting bit and, and maybe the hard, hard to take. I mean, if you, if you look at the smelter in 2009 and 2010, particularly 2010, we broke 40 records uh, on, in all fronts, uh, best environmental year ever, um, uh, one of the best uh, safety years we've had overall for total injury, um, uh, best stretch production year we've ever had, uh, and you look and say, well, we're, we're great, aren't we? We don't need to change. Um, but then when you, when you dig a little bit deeper, you actually find that, that that's not maybe sustainable unless you get some of the basics right. So this helped. We'll look a bit, a deep, bit deeper, and, and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit later, of some, of the, some of the more painful facts that we found. Yeah. So now that we've got a good picture of what it looks like today, the work here is to really design your future. And at this point, it's, you know, you got carte blanche. Forget about who you are. Let's think about who you want to be. And as an organization assigning the right resources to work with us to design that future state, understand how you're going to measure it, and then look at what's the best way to get this implemented into our organization so we can get the sustainable components, which we'll talk about in a minute, but at least get the, the organization moving down the path that the business process is going to improve. And at these stages, with these steps, it requires heavy involvement by, the act, by you as the organization. And Nick, you know, you had some tough decisions to make around who yeah, got involved. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny challenge because the, the norm is when you're firefighting and you have lots of, uh, sort of noise in the system and problems, your best resources tend to head for those problem areas. And so uh, we had to, had to really think in a different way and try and pull those best resources off onto our biggest opportunity. Uh, that was a, a totally different way to, to think about it, really, and, and it was hard for them 
because firefight is sexy and we're going to fix some problems and it's on the edge and you know we've got a production problem or we've got a challenge in the in the in the safety area and 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 I'm the I'm the hero that's going to ride in and, and we really had to force our best resources to go sit and really think critically about the processes and, and design a robust process that we could live with that, is, that was based on some of the things that we were already doing, but then leveraging some of the tools that, that KT provide um, and, and then blending that together, but having those best resources, those champions that can influence the rest of the organization, they had to own that. So when we came out of the other end of the process, then it had credibility, and because they were talking positively about the process and they really wanted to embed it, uh, they influenced the rest of the team, and so the team bought it, and, and that's how we, uh, we drove the success largely. Yeah. Which is actually what led into this last piece. They, they owned it with implementation, and we worked side by side with them to get it managed and executed and in place. And when we talk about that piece, the way we work with organizations is work side by side with you. So early on in the engagement, we'll lead more with your resources providing good information, good content expertise, and all that drives through implementation. But to move it into a sustainable nature, because we've all been through org times where we've brought consultants in, we get that you know, blip in success, and then when everybody goes, we kind of go the other way. One of KT's core beliefs is sustainability. So a big component of our effort is to work with you to get it sustainable. And that requires us to be part of that with you for a time, but, the, but there's a big shift in where responsibility lies. You know, we did a lot of work with you and your group on site. You can talk a little bit there. Yeah, uh, you get the, the view of the consultant that takes your watch from you and then tells you the time. Uh, so KT did take me watch and then told us the time for a while until I learned how to tell it myself, and then they gave us me watch back. So I got me watch back, uh, but... That, and that I didn't charge key. you for it either. It was, and, and, it, and I would say that there was some interesting stuff, but it was pretty uncomfortable for some of our really good engineers, in fact, to have somebody with them for a while, a bit like a sort of audit uh, review process. Uh, they weren't used to that sort of close coupling um, scrutiny on their work, which they felt was high quality work, and actually was in, in the largest case, but... but after a short while, they got real used to that and then appreciated the benefits. And uh, some of our, our very experienced engineers got a lot of value from that process. So, key to this in sustainability. All of this leads up to, and I'm, I know there's a lot on there. I'm not going to talk to every component of it. But key is that we make sure we get the right process integration. All the tools, business processes, and everything are clearly defined that you get the capability put in place to the organization and we transfer that with you in on site. Make sure we've got the right performance system that sets the right expectations, triggers for use, right feedback system and driving the use of those skills and the right level of coaching internally by, that's owned by the organization to sustain this for long term. So the whole model is built around getting you to a sustainable place that you really see the business improvement and it becomes part of you. It's no longer a new initiative. It is who you are. From a KT perspective, you know, typical engagements you might see with this with other organizations, yeah, they're results focused with predetermined measurable goals. It's short term with a defined time frame to get there. A lot of other organizations do data driven as do we with a lot of high team engagement. A little different about the way we work with you is we do a very targeted diagnosis, that upfront piece working with you, let's figure out the right business processes that you really need to be looking at. Then let's define what those measures are going to be throughout it. Here's where KT's rational processes really become a key component, not only in the final process you design, but as we go through the engagement with you, we actually use the tools with you to make good decisions. What are the right initiatives to go after? Let's find cause on some of the stuff that you really don't know. And let's understand how do we prevent things from going wrong as we move forward so that you get the full success. We also ensure that the capability gets transferred over. We don't just walk away and say, hey, you know, good luck. May the force be with you. <laughs> We want to be there with you because our reputation is about getting you successful so you can stand on your own with it. Additionally, it's ownership. And as Mick talked about, you know, as they worked with us, they owned it further and further into the process that they felt it was theirs. It wasn't KT's. It's who they are. And finally, 
that your performance system and measurements are in place with the right management, process ownership measures to sustain it long term. So a lot of theory, a lot of understanding what we did. Let's talk about what the real results were. Yeah. So, um, that so if we talk again about uh, the way forward, uh, I'll not go into all the detail, but we went through that design process, looking at the tools, uh, uh, trying to improve the ability and the response of daily management of those contractors, because it was really about, when we looked at it, we found lots of things that were drawing the, the contract engineers, drawing the contract administrators and project engineers away from the field and into the office. And so we had to try and get them out in the field. So how do we make them more efficient? How do we get them doing the right things? How do we make them consistent and, and take a standardized approach so they can learn and then own that, that process? So um, I think there's some good results that came out of it, and, and we'll, we'll cover a couple of those in a moment. So what did we look like uh, uh, historically? So this is our accident chart. Um, if you look at what happened, uh, let's have a look, go on. Particularly in uh, 2010, this is the end of 2010. Uh, had a pretty tough year last year. Uh, but you can see the general trend of overall injuries is still heading down. But we needed to try and accelerate that. Uh, a lot of those injuries were contractors. We needed to try and align them with how we, our own operators worked. Uh, if you look particularly, this is when our shutdown was, and we onboarded 1,800 contractors. We had a pretty challenging time. Uh, I have to say, we didn't have a robust process at that time for onboarding those contractors, looking after them. What were the contract administrators supposed to be doing? What checks did they need to make? Um, and so we tried the coaching cultural model uh, of onboarding, and for the first nine days of a 22-day of a, um, a shutdown, we had an accident every day. Uh, some of them recordable, some of them first aid, uh, but that was a bit of a nightmare. Uh, we cannot have that happening, so we went into compliance mode, and we found that uh, some of the discipline and rigor that were needed for short-term contractors, uh, it needed to be extremely robust and field-based. And so that's what we did. We drove that, and we actually had a pretty successful shutdown after that. We ended up with three recordable injuries in that total shutdown, and each of those recordable injuries were cut fingers. So no big disasters, but you can see the, uh, the spike up in the charts. Uh, I would like to have removed that if I could. We'll have another shutdown in 2012. Uh, we're busy preparing for, and we're going to onboard at least as many contractors again. Uh, and I'm expecting that there'll be no rise in the rate. In fact, it'll be zero with any sort of look. This is where, uh, this is where chart for recordable injuries. So last year, we had a big spike. Uh, there were they were low in severity, but, but high in frequency. So it was a pretty challenging year. We had to do something about it. You can see we got down to only five recordable injuries in the whole of 2009. Uh, it wasn't a shutdown year, but uh, you can see that we're, we're generally uh, improving. I'll come back to this in a moment, but that's where we are uh, year to date. You want to cover this? Yeah, real quick. You know, so as we moved into this in the current in the current state diagnostic, what we found over a four-week period, there were 12 potential areas where we could target improvement around their whole contractor management activities. And using our decision-making process, decision analysis process with Mick and the leadership team, we targeted in on four tactical projects and two sustainable projects that they were going to work with us together to move forward to improving their contractor management system. Now, to do that, it was key that they assigned the right resources to work with us. And here's where Mick had to take yeah, some challenging looks. It was, it was just having to free up those bodies, really, who, who had a full-time job. So the, the mindset was, you know, when am I going to do that? Is it going to be between 10 and midnight every day? Uh, and so we really had to look at the, the resource plan and, and just free them out. You know, consider that they just got run over by a beer truck, and they're not in the... They're not in the, the game anymore and free them up to spend some time on this process because uh, you've got to invest in the resources. If you don't do that, it's just going to take forever to achieve. So uh, we did that, and it was pretty painful, but it helped accelerate the, certainly the design process. Cool. 
So uh, some of the things that were found that were fairly painful, um, when, we say, when I say no standard processes for planning and monitoring of contracted work, we had a really robust internal planning process, an exceptional, in fact, uh, process for internal maintenance, and, and, uh, but we didn't have it for, for the contracted work. It was very ad hoc and at a high level. Um, uh, defined processes for responsibilities, it wasn't clear. So the CEAs and the project engineers uh, didn't feel like they were, they were on the block for who had to own that process and who owned the safety of the contractor, who owned the scope, who made the decisions about the scope. Um, lack of planning, so contractors would turn up and then we would work it out how to get that permit to work and get them up and running and, and working. And so it was, it, was, it was very firefighting oriented, I would say, compared to how it is now. Um, the contractor management system, we had, a, we had a pretty robust contractor management system, as it was called, and it had a lot of good policies in there. But actually, the, the biggest thing that was missing, it referred a lot to scope of work. And it said, this is the foundation, the scope of work. You must scope the work. And once you've scoped the work, then you can do your risk assessments based on that, your resource model based on that. You can, you can choose the right contractor, get them in at the right time, organize the operations around that. Unfortunately, it referred a lot to scope of work, but actually didn't tell you how to do it. Just didn't really say anything about, this is, this is, a, this is a helpful set of processes you can follow to, to, to create a good scope of work. Um, we have an engineering group that do huge projects, and they had an excellent process, but it was, it was like, a, a, like a giant for, for big, big million dollar projects. But we didn't really have anything for the 50 grand project and the $10,000 project and the, the probably $100,000 project that we needed. Um, there were some redundancies in the process. So we, had a, we talked a lot about safety and we had uh, like a sheep and a shear process to look at what are the, the safety hazards of the business uh, and what is the contractor supposed to do and, and what are they going to get exposed to when they get on site. But unfortunately, what we found was that that was very generic. So um, the, the last point that it's, uh, it wasn't clear um, who the contacts were, who was going to give them that information about the hazards. And then when you looked at the sheep and the shea, um, sometimes it was just a cookie cutter. So you would, you would get a contractor that you had used before and they would just use the previous um, plan from the work that they did before because it was generic enough to fit the bill. Um, and what we found with this process is we needed to drill in. We needed to have very good, simple, short scopes of work so that the, the guys on the ground, the contractors on the ground who were going to do the work, they could use that as a live document. It wasn't a management process anymore. It wasn't a procurement process. It was a, it was a piece of um, documentation that was used in the field so they could recognize the risks, they could, they could engineer the risk assessment and the controls around the specific risks for the job that they were going to do, not the generic risks of the smelter. You know, we'll have a million ton acid plant and a, and a hot metals plant and a grinding plant and a, a power plant. Uh, and, and, and sometimes you would find a shea and a sheep that covered all of these things when actually somebody was going to go in the field over there and dig a hole. So um, we really needed to focus in on that. So what we did were the, the projects that got identified for tactical. Two of them were kind of similar. So we were designing, scoping, and planning processes around what were classified as small jobs and others that were projects and look at the one best way. So it was all around how do you identify the need, scope the work, and when we talk about scoping of the work, you know, what, is, what are the deliverables, what's your expectations of your contractor, what are you asking them to do, and then tying, as Mick said, the shea and the sheep to the actual work, not to a generic set of activities. We also wanted to make sure that there was good information around how you handed off information from shift to shift. So we employed one of our methodologies around perfect shift of what's the right communication vehicle to understand if you got, you know, contractor working on shift one, different crew coming on on shift two, how do you communicate where you're at, shift that over, get the right communication around the safety hazards and where the work currently exists. <coughs> From a sustainability standpoint, it was let's make sure the organization is structured right with the right roles and responsibilities identified and the, the accountability at the right level within the organization. Mm -hmm. 
and then a process for how do you measure it in management. So his team worked with us to design these future state processes together to address those issues throughout the summer of last year and then move forward with implementation. Yep. From there. Yeah, and so, I mean, th these, these were critical, uh, uh, making sure that we had the right people in the right roles and we did have to adjust our organization a little bit. It did help with justify a, a couple of new resources, actually. Uh, so that was a good thing. Uh, we got some help to, to embed those processes. Um, and then I like measurement. I like the threshold target and stretch idea of understanding uh, what, what are you supposed to achieve and when are you supposed to achieve it. And what I found is, you know, I'm from the UK and so I'm fairly competitive, but when I got into this culture, I found that if you, if you tell people what you want and you give them a very, very clear expectation, they'll, they'll do it. But if you make it gray, they'll just do their own thing. But they're very, very competitive at, at Kennecott and I'm, I'm, I'm maybe tarring everybody with that same brush, but I think uh, if you can be very clear with your expectations and your targets, tap into that competitive spirit, then you'll meet your targets. And if you set tough targets, they'll be met. Think about it in, that, in the terms of what is the minimum that I have to meet, what is the target that I would like to meet, and what is the, what is the gold, what is the gold medal. A uh, couple of things, uh, you'll not be able to uh, read this directly, but I'm sure you'll see it on the, the paperwork afterwards. But it was, it was designed in some really simple process flow diagrams so that there was a, some gates so the engineers could make quick decisions. Where am I? Yes, no, which way am I going to go? What have I got to do? Um, and so it made their processes more efficient. And if we can make it easier for the engineers, then they're gonna be more effective and efficient, they're gonna spend more time out in the field, and we'll get a virtuous cycle rather than making the process heavy. Uh, so it was a big um, focus on the process overall to try and make life easier for the engineers rather than give them some, you know, 10 more sheets of paper to fill in and make life harder, uh, because that was, just gonna, that was just gonna bog you down in noise further. And then uh, uh, it, it was an interesting one because we were the pilot site we have more contractors than anybody else, so it was interesting to, to take us on as the, as the, the pilot, but uh, the key was that we wanted to put certain designs into the, into the process just for the smelter, but actually we had to make it pretty um, transferable to, to all the six business units because those six business units are all pretty different. You know, uh, Ted Heimbau, the general manager at the mine, has got 400 uh, truck drivers and, and he's got Komatsu working on working on HME and, and other things, and, and I've got tons of fixed plant and acid plants and power plants and hot metals and casting. And so very different environments, uh, different structures and different challenges. So this process had to be transferable across them all, and, it, uh, and it's working, in fact. That's why uh, Leo's still, still with us. It's supposed to be a, a, a training, coaching, and handoff process, and it's lar that's largely happened at the smelter, so it's, it's largely been handed off at the smelter, but we're now implementing it in the other business units yes. across Kennecott and, and seeing some good results. Some challenges, of course, always, but some good results. Um, I'm going to rip through that because we're going to be running out of time. Uh, let's have a look. Is there anything particularly you want to pick up off that slide, uh, Leo? Other than the key through there was having a good communication plan throughout the activity, throughout the engagement both up in the organization and down in the organization. So you, it wasn't a surprise to everybody when it was getting implemented. Mm -hmm. So everybody knew from a leadership on down where we were moving and what the results were, they were looking for and what the changes were that were coming. Good. So um, coaches in the coaching, so it was interesting, uh, this sort of handover process, training, coaching, and handover. Uh, it was essential that we put our best people in as coaches so that um, during that uh, implementation and sustaining phase, we had champions within what business, left within what business when, when KT went off and, and did something else. Uh, we, we had the ownership of the process, we're in there on the design phase, so we had that, that level of ownership and then uh, with a mindset for continuous improvement, always looking to improve that process further and further. Uh, and so that was, that was a critical part that you have to put your best resources on it or or it's gonna be real difficult for them to influence uh, the people in your organization who are more influential than them. Um, and then 
ownership of the process, and, and I already talked about measurements, but it, it was critical to set up that dashboard and just, and we've got dashboards, like a bit of a hierarchy of dashboards, if you like, so one for the SLT, my boss and his boss and the, and the board to see how are they doing generally and some real top end measures, but then feed us all the way down and into what is that individual contract administrator or project engineer going to be measured against. And, uh, and even though there's a bit of trepidation initially there, people don't necessarily like to be measured that, that closely. They like it now because it gives them a clear uh, objective to meet and generally they meet it. Um, and so then when they go through quarterly reviews and they get performance reviews, they've got good evidence to take into that quarterly review and say, this is the good work that I did and I'm proud of it. Uh, and you need to give us a good bonus. So <laughs> obviously I use that as well with my boss. Um, so uh, what did we see? They're just a few examples uh, of some of the uh, three of the jobs that, that ran towards the end of last year and, and the start of this year. Uh, where we've got uh, clear savings based on, based on this process. There were a lot of others, uh, a lot of intangible savings and value add, uh, but I mean, there's 180 grand's worth of savings, uh, which were very, very clearly linked to this process and, and, and how we better scope the work and then manage the scope of that work and the changes to that scope. I mean, how often uh, do you have a contractor come in and say, oh, I had to put three extra nuts on that boat and, and I'm gonna charge you 50K for that. Um, and I didn't get authorized for it, but you didn't tell us that I needed to get authorized for that. Um, so that, that worked really well, that it gave, it gave what engineers a, a much better framework to push back a little bit on. And it sounds quite negative towards the contractor, but actually it wasn't, because initially maybe it felt that way, but then they found that it was very clear for them, and in fact gave them a mechanism to say, I know who I need to come and talk to because there is a problem on this project and I'm gonna highlight it early because if I don't highlight it early, I'm gonna potentially get punished for it. But if I highlight it early, we can plan for it better, it's safer work, and I can then uh, get paid for that work. So that worked. So what are we looking at now? Uh, this year, year to date, uh, two recordable injuries Zero lost time injuries, in fact. We just passed a million hours without any lost time injuries. So we're pretty proud of that. Uh, and our expectation is that we're never going to have a lost time injury again. Uh, our last lost time injury was a pretty bad one uh, where we covered uh, a guy in molten material uh, up on the furnace area. That is not going to happen again. That is an unacceptable thing to happen in our business. We'll have to stop hurting people. And so... This is helping where it's one part of a jigsaw puzzle. That's helping we get to zero, but it's a critical part. We actually just went through a site safety acceleration process uh, across the whole of Kennecott and looked at what are the, the key things that are gonna drive uh, zero harm at Kennecott and then in the wider Rio Tinto and contractor management and excellence in that was one of the critical four things that we need to focus on. So really pleased that this trend is heading in the downward direction and uh, pleased to say that both of these injuries were medical treatment and the, the, the person who got a cut, one on the leg and one on the arm, came straight back to work. So um, really pleased that that was uh, not zero impact on the families, but, but low impact. Uh, that's just a bit of an indication of uh, the breakdown. So if you look at total injury, not just recordable injury, that's where we are year to date. So we're nearly halfway through the year and uh, and we've had two recordables and three first aids. So pretty proud of that, but it's not zero, so not completely proud of it yet. Uh, I'll be really happy in 2012 if we can get through with no injuries whatsoever, and particularly the big challenge of a shutdown and the onboarding of 1,800 contractors. It's not going to be easy, but uh, we're going to be focused on that very heavily. Um, some other results, uh, you, can, you can read those later. Some, some real uh, good things, though, around scope creep and and other aspects that help we tighten up the processes, help our engineers do a better job and feel good about it. So conclusion on results, what, did, what was the challenge? Costs escalating and, and, and safety. I showed you the safety chart, it's getting better and better. And from a costs perspective, uh, it's going pretty well. Um, we're finding that we're doing more contractor work this year than we did even last year. Uh, other than that shutdown portion, we're doing a lot of contractor work uh, and we're doing all that work with the same number of uh, contract 
administrators and project engineers, and they're doing it well, and they're probably working less hours uh, and feeling, feeling much better about it. So from a resource perspective, really good, and we're currently under budget by, by some distance this year. So a uh, lot, of, lot of things that contribute to that, uh, but um, certainly contractor management is one of those pieces of the jigsaw. And uh, I think currently it's about to the tune of $6 million we're under budget, so uh, it's going pretty well. Some critical success factors? Yeah, we've talked a lot about them throughout the discussion here. Key is top management's commitment, that they really want to improve that business process, that they're gonna get the right resources assigned to it, and patience in getting it done, but see it as a project. You commit those resources full time to go after this for the improvement. And then from that standpoint, Mick, you know, the willingness that you guys had to look at yourselves hard. Uh, and you've got to, got, to, got to have a look at the warts, unfortunately, and then uh, do something about it. Look for the pockets of excellence as well, I would have to say, because uh, probably in your business you're doing a lot of great things, and it's leveraging those and getting everybody doing those things as a standard rather than just you know, a real good project engineer. How do you have a real good projects department? I uh, think we're good. I think we're good. So uh, we did overrun by four minutes, but I noticed they only give with 35 minutes yeah, instead they, of 40, which, uh, which we were given in the, in the early part. You must have had a vote outside because I was standing between you and your lunch. So I'm, <laughs> I'm suspecting there's going to be zero questions. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. So what want. questions do you have for us? Yes. I don't know if there's a mic for you. There's a big red light here flashing. So you route that you've overrun. <laughs> I was just kind of curious when you guys were going through defining the current state of, of some of the approach, how did you, what kind of mechanisms or tools you use to kind of prioritize the work? Because um, I think there might be a struggle with some, some facilities may not have good data and some of it, and some of them do. So I think the sites that don't have really good data or have a, have a struggle with that to try to define the, the actual scope, I mean, how did you guys approach it? Depending upon what the business process is that we're going to look at, in this case, it was clearly defined, we wanted to look at how was work getting scoped? So what physical evidence was there? How are you managing them when they're on site? So let's do some walk arounds with you guys and see what they're doing. Uh, let's look at those shays. How, how focused are they to the actual work you're having? So what we will do is we'll, we'll structure the diagnostic tools to the business process. And we'll, it'll, some of it will be anecdotal. Some of it will be quantitative. Some of it will be qualitative. Right, so we'll go through all that with you, but we'll define that with you up front for that specific business process. So we did use some current data, because we had a lot of data, Kennecott likes to measure stuff, and I've never seen more reports in all my life. Uh, so we used some of that, but really it didn't, it didn't give with a full picture, so we'll have to spend some time analyzing. Uh, so we did that, did some measurements. And Lunch must be good today. No more questions. Oh, there's one. There's one. So we've got a Where mic. Where's it going? Over here. You've got a question for me specifically, so I kind of I kind of hand it off to Leo. <laughs> no, you no, tell Mick, me yours uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> when you talked about uh, having to pull your A team off of the day, their day jobs, you know, off the you know firefighting and that, did you find that that turned out to be easier than you thought? And how did you do it? I mean. You know, I can see where that wouldn't be easy. You know, it's a funny thing, but um, in the mindset, if you ask somebody, have you got some time? I'll say, oh, no, I'm far too busy. I'm, me, me day is full to the brim. But everybody takes a holiday, for instance. If you, if you take poorly, you're going to be off. Somebody's going to pick up the strain. Uh, one, one thing that, that, that we did learn uh, that we could have applied a bit better, probably, was to generate, it may sound a bit weird, generate some lists of what not to do anymore. So generate a list, yeah, everyone's got their to-do lists. You need a list of what not to do anymore because you've probably got crazy amounts of waste. We had crazy amounts of waste, you know. So time management. 50 people in a, yeah. in a meeting when you really needed three or four and then a good report, good executive summary coming out of a meeting. So thinking about some, some basic uh, time uh, management uh, tools, freeing up some time, but, but it, it wasn't pain free. Uh, you, you basically just had to say, right, you're going to be out of the business for the next week, you're out of the business for the next week, and you 10 people there are going to spend two hours um, f for three days next week. Uh, so you're going to work full time on it, and you're going to work part time on it, and get on with it. And it was, oh, 
what am I going to do? My emails are backing up, and there's some things that need done. And, uh, but it's strange but true. It all gets picked up. The business keeps on going. And uh, you just got to have the faith that it's a good investment, but you want return on that investment. Um, so you know, be critical and, and push the team hard to come up with some good results. Simple, though. I wouldn't say easy, but simple. I think we came up with some really simple things that, that make life easier for the guys at the sharp end. Probably make, made life a little bit more difficult for us uh, because it's not easy to, to, to get the simplicity, but, uh, but it certainly helped uh, the teams to be more efficient. So even though they invested a lot at the front end, uh, they're finding that they've actually got more time to do qualitative work out in the field. And they enjoy that more. I mean, who doesn't enjoy interacting with the teams and doing quality safety interactions and talking to people rather than sitting at the computer and doing purchase recs and, and all that, all that crap. Another question? One more. Since we're all trying to drive to zero accidents and what we're finding in our operation is, and we're all measuring now all incident rate instead of, instead of just the severe incidents, how do you manage the, the keeping people focused and not losing focus for that one instance? Because what we find is our accidents are either fingers, strains and sprains, or slips and falls, and they're really not due necessarily to the process, it's due to you know, a, a instant of inattention. And how do you handle that to get to zero? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting challenge, actually. When you look at 2010, uh, out of the 13 recordable injuries that we had, we had 10 of them were hand injuries, uh, stitches and broken fingers and cut fingers. Um, so what we did, actually, the, the, the traditional way is to focus on the individual and say, what did you not do right? You didn't do your track assessment or your pre-job risk assessment or whatever, and basically focus in on the individual and try and coach and improve their performance. And so instead of doing that, we're focused on the equipment and the environment. So end of last year, um, as part of the drive towards zero harm, uh, we, we put out a note to ban pry bars from our business, to ban knives from the site, and to take out hammers that are bigger than four pounds. Everybody went, what? How can you do that? It's impossible. We've been working with pry bars forever. And what we found was we didn't get pry bars completely out of the business. But by taking, if you like, a bold step that tried to push them further and look at the equipment and the engineering side of it rather than the individual side, we got benefits across uh, the whole of the smelter rather than just one person working more safely in the future. Because if we had focused on that, then we would have had those 13 people working more safely. And I'm pretty sure after the robust conversation that we had with them, they wouldn't have any more accidents. But uh, really, we needed the other 600 all working safe. And how do you do that? Through rewards. And, and one of those rewards is making their life easier. So for instance, uh, where uh, they close up the furnace with hot metal and all these ge this gear on um, five times a day, uh, and before they were using this big bar and a big hammer and they would be swinging this hammer at each other and bashing the, bashing the back of the bar and shut, closing off a furnace, uh, flowing hot metal. Uh, we bought them some tools and now they use a gun and they plug it in and press the button and it just shuts the furnace. It's done in about a tenth of the time that it took them before. It's easier. We had to buy some tools. We had to train them. Uh, but one of the operators came up with that idea and apparently had had that idea many times, but nobody was listening. So expert engagement and rewarding people for the good ideas that they come up with and then thinking more about the work and environment and the tools and the equipment that they use rather than the individual behaviors. It still comes down to personal. Eh? Zero, it's personal. There's no doubt about it. People have to make good decisions. You can give them the best tools in the world and the best processes, but they still have to make good decisions. But you can help people make good decisions, and you can reward people with a better working environment, better tools, um, and, and certainly reward people with, with other things like you know, safety dinners and things. We've, we've done all sorts of things as a blend to try and engage with our employees more. But the biggest benefit we've had is uh, listening hard to the ideas that they've got, because the, the risks that they're exposed to at the sharp end, the employees know generally how to fix that problem if you ask them. But they're not going to say, it's me, you need to coach me harder. Or they're going to say, I need, need this tool or I need that process. So, does that answer your question? Good. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Leo and 
Hey, Mick. Thanks. Good.